So I want to introduce to you today a very explosive speaker and great author uh, and a good friend now, I hope that, Jonathan Martin, come on up here. Thank you, friend. Wow. What a wonderful introduction. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. That's genius. That's brilliant, actually. Surviving the Shipwreck. Oh, and there's my theme song. Straight through the heart of them righteous uprights. Drop, kick me, Jesus. Drop, kick me, Jesus. I, hope, I don't know why you're laughing. This is a song that deeply ministers to me. This was my grandma's favorite song, and you're all laughing. No, I'd never heard it before this weekend, and now I'm like, this is my favorite song. That's amazing. Wow, thank you. What, um, so I'm overwhelmed with all kind of emotions right now. First of all, it's been an amazing weekend. I can't say enough about how much I love your church. Raymond, I can't say enough about how much I love you, your pastor. What a great time we've had. What a great human being he is, you already know. But I also have to say this, and I'm, I have no need or desire to, like, flatter here. But, you know, like, I, I go to a lot of different churches, and, you know, I, I want to give this as a disclaimer. I never enter into worship as a critic. Um, I, I'm a participant. I love to worship Jesus in any and all kinds of ways. No matter what the worship is, I'm going to enter in, and I'm like, like I'm going, I'm going to fully participate, and I'm going to love Jesus, and it's going to, it's going to be fine. But I will tell you this: one of the things that I, if you talk to me privately, I would say that drives me bananas about worship now. It's kind of like how every town in America sometimes can feel like they look the same, like with the golden arches or whatever. I know the worship set before I get to the church. I know which Hillsong song they're going to do. I know which uh, Bethel song they're going to do. And they're great songs. There's nothing wrong with the songs. Every church does the same song. Every band sounds alike. They dress alike. And I will tell you that even though people love Jesus and I bless them, the monotony drives me bananas. And then I come here today and I'm like, oh, dear God. This is truly this is perhaps the best worship I've experienced in a local church. Well, that's the truth. Like, like, like ever, ever. Like, that was unbelievable. Like, truly. So, like, y'all blew my mind. That was so good. And, like, I mean, there's, there's, there's blues to it. There's soul to it. See, that's the thing. And I don't, I don't know why I'm doing this right now, except this is just stuff that I think about. So, y'all bear with me. But, see, like, so many, like, so many like white churches where they have guitars, like I'm fine to have guitars, but there's no soul. You can have guitars and not have soul. And like, I just understand people like have guitars, but no soul. Like you can do that in a way, like everything feels like just so poppy and like whatever, like there was soul this morning and like depth and there's like ache. Like when was the last time I've been in worship where there was any like sense of ache? And I'm like, oh, that's so good. I love it too that you said like this was like, for Palm Sunday, this is like the downbeat worship. I'm like, that's amazing. So this is downbeat. I really want to be back for Easter. And this was this, this, this was low key. <laughs> Unbelievable, man. That just like singed my hair. And like normally worship that good, like it makes you want to preach. But like I was so caught up in it, I just kind of want to crawl under the pew and just lay down now. I was so good. Man, that was amazing. So thank you for that. Y'all are spoiled rotten is what I'm saying. I hope you know you're spoiled rotten by your music. That was unreal. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something mildly, mildly vulnerable. We're going to go to text here in just a second. I got a little distracted right before I came up because I realized in the NRSV, which I'm using, I want to talk about the donkey Jesus rode on, the, rode on and I realized that in the text, that it says a cult, and that messed with me because I know like Matthew says that there's a cult and a donkey. I do actually think this is, cult can be an ambiguous word. I think this is the donkey. I almost was going to go to Matthew because it explicitly says donkey, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to keep the text that I gave them instead of messing with y'all up there, and y'all will just know, uh, yeah, I didn't want to get you mad at me. I felt like I could get in bad graces really fast, uh, but that got me messed up a little bit. I was like, should I use the other text? Blah, blah, blah. I do, that's what happens when you're like too Pentecostal. It's like I change things 
last minute all the time. And the people will tell me sometimes that that's uh, about my sermons. They're like, man, I really, when you, you started, you started talking about this, and I'll say like, I really didn't know where that was going to go. And I will often respond and say, well, you know, I didn't know where that was going to go either. So the suspense is actual, you know. So <laughs> I always, I told the guys this weekend, I self-refer as a hillbilly Pentecostal. Uh, I come from North Carolina. I come from the southeast. My dad's a preacher. My grandfather's a preacher. Deep roots kind of in sweaty tent revival. You know, sweat and sawdust is kind of where I come from. So that part of me, you know, Texas makes sense in some ways. There's some things that, that connects. But you know, it, is, it is true that I am probably a little less experienced with the shooting than some of y'all are. And, uh, yeah, that was a true story. The guys were really helpful in that way. I just, like, I needed the other day when I shot the rifle, there was something manly inside of me that just needed to hit, to hit that on the first try. So I'll be coming back from Conroe this weekend feeling like a man. I just want you all to know. <laughs> I feel like a man. That sounds a little weird, doesn't it? <laughs> Came back from Conroe feeling like a man. What does that even mean? Uh, <laughs> clearly, I'm feeling right at home. Thanks for indulging me. Y'all clearly know how to have a good time. I do want to go to the Palm Sunday text. It's a great text. It's a great story. And one that I want to encourage you to look at from uh, perhaps a different angle this morning, and that's particularly the, the angle of said donkey in the text. Zechariah in particular prophesies about the time that will come when a king will come riding in on a donkey, which of course is a subversive image in a couple different ways. You know, all throughout antiquity, of course, we think of kings riding on horses, not donkeys. We have such an image in Revelation 19, Jesus riding on the white horse. But here, Jesus rides on a, on a donkey. And there's different layers of meaning to that, I think. A king riding on a donkey symbolizes peace and peacemaking. But as Zechariah will gesture uh, in particular, I think it has something to do with the humility of Jesus. A lot of things I could preach about. I mean, I, there are 15 things I'd love to say about this text. But I'm not going to do any of that because I want to specifically focus on this particular beast of burden, this donkey in the text. Let's, uh, let's pray just one more time before we dive in. God, I am so grateful for the gift of my new friends here. And I do feel like that. I feel like I've made new friends. This already feels like family. God, I'm thankful for Pastor Raymond. I'm thankful for his leadership, for his vision, his heart, his humor, his openness, there's an authenticity in this room, and there's, there's something that's just genuine and real um, that I find so rare um, sometimes when I travel. So, God, I'm just grateful for that. I'm grateful for what feels like a real move of the Spirit among real people here. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for the gift of this community, for the way that we experience you through the gift of each other. Now, God, we just come to that time where by your spirit, we want to experience you through your word. So I just ask that you would now address us, that you would speak to us, that you would just uh, put our hearts in a posture now where we'd be able to receive your word in wherever, in whatever form we most need to hear it. And I do pray that in that way that only your spirit can do, that you would allow this to become a, a tailored very specific word for each of your daughters and each of your sons who are here, uh, for truly we need to hear a word, and we come, we are listening. We ask all of this in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and everybody said, amen. Let's go right to the text, Luke 19, beginning with verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem when he had come near Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find there a cult. And because, you know, when there's a text like this, for whatever the reason, I want to go very King James on you guys. You will find there an ass that has never been ridden. Always loved those things when I was in Sunday school. Untie it and bring it to me. 
bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. And I've taken that from my title this morning. I love this simple phrase. The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, (laughs) as you do when someone comes along and they begin to untie your colt, that's just, (laughs) that just hit me funny in a way that had not before. Like, uh, uh, go and get this car. And uh, as I did, could you imagine this, Dell? And the owner's like, why are you doing this? <laughs> the owners, uh, th- th- they do ask the question Jesus said they would ask. Why are you untying the colt? They said the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. But he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, The stones would shout out. We know that this is a bittersweet text because um, the mob will do what mobs always do. They turn quickly. One week it's Hosanna. Um, It's haunting to know that a week later this will turn to crucify him. There's so much going on in this text. But this morning I'm just so, so captured in particular by this this character of the donkey. I was already thinking about the donkey, and I already wanted to preach about the donkey. I knew that's where I wanted to go. And then in a way that felt very providential to me, and again, maybe because of my very Pentecostal roots, I can be too mystical about things. But as we were staying in um, Franklin, right? Is that the name of town, Franklin? Franklin. Less than five miles away from the tornado yesterday, by the way, we were very close to that, um, there was a picture in the house that I loved. And I had to know the story behind this picture. And thankfully, Raymond called his friend, the owner of the house, now my new friend, and got the story behind this picture. I wanted to share it with you. Can we go to, can we go to that now? There's, so there's this, this beautiful picture of his daughter with, um, like, so basically his, um, I'm sorry, was it the niece? Am I saying this right? It's his niece, okay. This is his niece, and she's with this beautiful white donkey. And I just thought it was such a great picture. I mean, everything, I don't know. um, I love the way she's looking at the donkey. I love the way she's kind of embracing the donkey. And to me, there's so much going on in that picture that you can understand without necessarily having to have words for the way that a child looks at a donkey you know there's a, the way that a child looks at anything there's a kind of wonder and there's an enchantment and an animal is a is a friend and you just see it there and you see the donkey just looks so happy and it's a sweet picture I love they had that they had it up in the house so I had to know, what is the story behind this donkey? And I'm sorry to tell you that actually there's kind of a sad story behind the donkey here. Because as it turns out, so his niece really did love the donkey. But um, the, the, the dad there, you know, like he, you know, basically he had horses too. And there was a situation where the donkey started chasing the horses. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I started chasing the cows. I can't talk this morning. This, I've, I've, been, I've been up for a very long time and having a good time. Thank you. I need all the help I get this morning. So the donkey's chasing the cows, and it's kind of a deal. And he didn't want to go to the trouble of building a fence, right? So the owner of the house, our friend, had said to his brother-in-law, hey, well, if, you know, if you're not going to build a fence, then this is going to continue to be an issue. 
why don't you just go down and, you know, because they do this up the road, why don't you just go and sell the donkey? So he says, well, that's what I'm going to do. He decides to, to go out and he's going to sell the donkey. So when he gets down to where they trade the animals and he's going to sell the donkey, they say, okay, like, well, you can't, you can't actually sell the donkey unless you have a certificate of health. He says, well, what do I have to do to get a certificate of health? He said, well, you just have to go up the street, pay 30 bucks, they'll give you the certificate. He says, I'm not paying 30 bucks in order to get this certificate of health. So he decides, and man, I just, I, I feel like the Grinch right now, especially for any kids in the room. So he just decides, okay, I, and I'm not going to fool with this. I'm not going to pay 30 bucks. Decides to shoot the donkey in the head. I'm just, kill, just kills the donkey. Does it tell, does it tell the, the, the daughter about it? Just kills the donkey. And uh, I'm sorry, what's that? Oh, knees, thank you for that. Um, so then, you know, the donkey's now in the freezer, just like meat. And she doesn't find out until she's actually hiking later that she, when she kind of sees the, you know, the carcass, that the donkey's gotten. Of course, she's, of course, she's terribly sad, as any kid would be, because, you know, I mean, look at the picture here. You can see this is like a connection with the animal. And I just, what struck me so much about this story is that I just thought, just the difference in value there, right, between like the way the little girl sees the donkey, and the donkey's a friend, and there's this kind of emotional connection, the, the, the way that, you know, like for an adult, for a man, for a guy who just says like, oh, you know, I don't want to fool with this animal, let's just kill it. Two very different ways of looking at the same animal. And I, I, that just feels especially relevant to me when I think about, I don't know, I mean, what an unlikely, imagine being the donkey that Jesus decides to ride on, right? I mean, that's some kind of donkey, right? I mean, the, the, the Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, King of kings and Lord of lords is going to ride on you? Like, what, what a crazy part to play in the story. And I, I'm thinking about it in particular this way this morning. Like, uh, if this doesn't sound too weird for y'all. Like, I do, I want to be that donkey that Jesus rides on. Like, I want to be the one who brings the king into the city. I want to be the vehicle. I want to be the instrument through which Christ uh, brings his love and his mercy. Like, I want to be that kind of blessing, right? I mean, I think all of us would aspire to do that. But I also know that um, as it is like in this little story, I just think, you know, man, a, a donkey's a donkey. And all of us, depending on where we live and where we come from, may have a very different understanding of our own worth or the worth that's been assigned to us. Um, the way that others see us, the way that we may see ourselves so different than the way that Jesus looks at us. And not to get too preachy with this text, but one of the things I love most about it is that the first thing that Jesus says, you know, about this donkey, when you find it, that you've got to untie it. Find a colt that's never been ridden and untie it. So many of us who've never been tamed, wild, undomesticated, and I think for those of us who are a little bit on the wilder side, for those of us who are not easily tamed, for those of us who are not easily broken, you can think that somehow this makes you less eligible to be used by God. But I'm telling you, the more you get to know about Jesus, and I think this bears out in the whole story of Scripture, by the way, God especially likes the wild ones. Am I telling the truth? The wilder you are. This has always been true. This has always been true. Even the Old Testament, right? Have you ever noticed that the ones that God likes the most are the people who talk back? I didn't even plan on talking about this, but that's the truth. God likes the ones that talk back. People like Moses, people like Job, that's that very Hebrew way, the people who, cont who kind of contest with God. At the very end of Job, there's a verse I really love where God says that Job, unlike his friends, has spoken rightly of him. Well, that's funny because earlier God just corrected Job's theology 
and said that Job was wrong. He doesn't mean that Job's theology was right. When you really study the text, what he says, what he's really saying is not so much that Job spoke right, spoke rightly of him, but that Job spoke right to him. That's what God loves so much about Job, that he got in his face, that he talked back, that he, comp- he went mano in mano with God. There was a wildness there. There was a wild streak that was there. The wild streak is something, that undomesticated streak, is something God actually likes and wants. And yet when God comes to us, so many of us, all of us really in some form or another, He comes to us and we're tied up. Tied up with any and all sorts of things. And everybody's tied up with something. It can be a Addiction, it can be alcoholism, it can be drugs, it can be one of the conventional things, but there's so many other things to be tied up with. I think especially for those of us who, and I know in Texas, as it is for some, somebody like me, a North Carolina boy, many of us are actually quite tied up, ironically, by religion. Religion can bind us up. Religion can be oppressive and constricting and It's like Jesus says to the Pharisees one time, when you make converts, you make them twice the sons, you make double the sons of hells that you are, right? Like religion can, can, can bind us. Bitterness can bind us. Rage, unforgiveness. There's so many things that can bind us. And yet Jesus comes along to those of us who are wild, to those of us who are undomesticated, and says... Loose it. Loose the animal. And why? 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 Because he anticipates the question. He knows the question is going to come. Why are you doing this? And I want you to hear this through a different lens. Not just kind of like in a, I don't know, like a, don't, don't just hear the question is like, why are you doing this? Hear the edge to it. Why are you doing this? Why? that person. Why this unimpressive donkey? Why this ass when you could have a horse? Why this animal? Why? Why? God knows people have surely said that about us. Why on earth would God fool with somebody like that? And not only have people said it about us, if you're anything like me, I've looked in the mirror and asked it about a million times. And I've done it many times since being called to ministry. Why on earth? Why, God, why? Why would you choose me? Why? Knowing all the things that I know about me, how on earth, how on earth could you possibly choose me? Why are you doing this? And yet I love the response that Jesus gives. He says, when they ask you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The master needs it. Isn't that beautiful? The master needs it. Man, I love that phrase. Which I guess means we need to think for a minute about the word need. The master needs it. How is it that the master needs it? Well, if by need, what you mean is that like this one donkey is the only donkey in the universe that Jesus could have possibly rode on, well, no, there are other donkeys. There are other donkeys in the fields. There are other fish in the sea. Yes, technically there are others. There are other choices. There are other options. You know, I've heard people say in sermons many times, and to a point I get this, this is true, like, you know, this sort of like, you know, almost kind of like in a flippant way, you know, like, man, God calls you to do something. You know, if you don't do it, God don't need you. He'll just move along to somebody else. Well, I mean, like, God can move along. So, like, yes, Someone else can bring the coleslaw to the picnic. Someone else can sing the special. Y'all can tell I'm a certain product of a certain kind of church culture that I just said, sing the special. 
someone else can preach the sermon. There's, all, there's always someone else who, who can do it. So it's not that the master needs it in the sense that, like, if, if, if this one person doesn't fill the role, then it logistically, physically, practically can't be done. Of course, it technically could be done by someone else. But you see, there's a particularity to love, and there's a particularity to how God chooses in a way that says, yes, maybe someone else could technically do this, but I don't want them to do this. I want you. Maybe somebody else could, but I choose you. I mean, you know, for those of us who know what it is to really be in love, I'm at a place right now and where there's a lot of things in my life that are green and hopeful and a lot of grace, and I am in love, and I am thankful for that. And like, you know, when you're in love, like, could you be in love with somebody else? Oh, why, why, why yes, I could love someone else. Just pluck someone else into the formula. Like, who talks like that? <laughs> if you talk like that, you most certainly are not in love. <laughs> well, you know, people are interchangeable, and technically you probably could meet someone else and have the same sort of chemical attraction. Run from that person! <laughs> You ever go on a date with somebody like that, like just like, like get the check right now? I mean, why don't we just go ahead and settle for a companionship? I mean, the, come on, like that's not, that, that's not how love works. Because there's a heart thing that says, I won't settle for anybody other than you. Nobody else is going to do the trick. No, nobody else is going to fit here just right. And I think that there's a particularity to how God loves his sons and daughters that is just like that. That everybody is called by God in such a way that there is a, there is a place in God's heart. There is, um, there is a work that God has called you to do. I think that's secondary to the place you have in his heart, but that too. There's something that God wants you to do. There's a place in the kingdom for you where, where it can honestly be said, the master needs you. And I know that can sound so ridiculous. I mean, there's that whole like, what do you get for the man who has everything? What do you, the, the God who has everything. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know, I know. He's got billions of people that he could choose from. But he chooses you. He wants you Nobody else is gonna. Nobody else is gonna do it. Nobody else is gonna fill that place in his heart. And I just feel like this morning that somebody, somebody in particular, really needs to hear that word. How whatever whatever wildness is in your life right now, whatever way that you feel tied up right now, and whatever way you feel addicted, and whatever way that you feel chained, that even this morning that Jesus comes to you. And that, that, that with, with the sweetness that says, the master needs you, the master's calling you, the master wants you. There's nothing about your life, there's nothing about your past that disqualifies you from being used by God. That's one of the things that's so marvelous to me about the donkey and the story, is that when Jesus comes riding on an unimpressive donkey, there's going to be no question as to who's going to get the glory here, <laughs> I'm very, aware of, I'm very aware of that. I mean, I think I've always been aware of that, but at this point in my life, like never before. And even writing the book, How to Survive a Shipwreck, which I, don't even, I did not intend that to be a plug. But it just, you know, it came out of my own unraveling. If I've ever been aware of my own unworthiness, they're so, so aware of my own unworthiness. And yet, I've never been more in love with Jesus, never been any happier in that way, because I just, like, I know what it is to be chosen by God and to still be used by God in the depths. And here's the crazy thing about God in this way. We talked about this some this weekend, just informally even with some of the guys. How it is that actually the things about you that are the most broken, that you think would most disqualify you from being used by God, shockingly become the very things that God will use most profoundly in your life. 
the very area in which you are broken is the very thing that God will now use to bring healing to others. Talking to a dear man in this church who shared his testimony this weekend of sexual abuse, who is now using that testimony to bring such healing to others. Oh, I love to hear that. The very thing about you that seems to be the most broken is the thing that God uses. You know, I actually feel like I'm, I'm pretty much more or less done, but if y'all don't mind, I'm just having a good time right now. If y'all just, if I, can I have a minute? I mean, this is what Paul is talking about in Corinthians. This whole thing about having this treasure in earthen vessels. In, in, in the town of Corinth, they literally were known for making cheap lamps. I mean, I don't have light bulbs, but they had lamps with, like, you know, with, with fire in it. And the cheap lamps. The idea, literally, these earthen vessels is that the vessels were so cracked. That, that's the idea. God has placed his light inside vessels that are so cracked and so flimsy that the maximum amount of light is going to get out. There's such power in that. So it's like, I just feel like I talk to people all the time who struggle because they feel like they're too broken to be used by God. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. The brokenness that you think disqualifies you to be used by God might be the very thing that most qualifies you to be used by God. Because brokenness will break you open. It makes you vulnerable. And when you're humble, that's the thing. When you're humble, there's, God can do anything through your life. The more, the more humble you are, the more dependent you are, the more beautiful a work God can do in you and through you. Is any of that making sense? I just feel like somebody needs that word this morning. So I don't want to just, I don't want to belabor the thing, but I just hope today that somehow you can catch a glimpse of how it is that Jesus looks at you. And it's not utilitarian, you know, it's not like you don't just have, it's not just that there is work to be done on the farm or something. I think it's way more like the little girl in the picture. Those, those, that, 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 that you fill him with such joy and such delight that he hovers over you with delight. Uh, I, I've, I, I, I think about this so much, and I promise I am closing on this, really. But I go back to this all the time, that before Jesus begins his earthly ministry, and I think it's significant that it's before. You know, it's not after he's passed the test of the temptation in the wilderness, much less, you know, gone on to endure all the way to the cross. It's before he's done anything. It's before he's accomplished anything. It's before there's been any success that the Father proclaims over him, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. That's the foundation of everything. Jesus. Before he passed the test, before he was perfectly obedient in all the trials, God already said, you are my Son in whom I'm well pleased. And I need you to hear that this morning. You can't get your life together and then think that God delights in you. You have to understand first, God delights in you right this very second. He loves to see you coming in whatever shape you're in. There has never been a moment, including at your lowest moment, when you did not bring God active delight because that's how crazy God is about his sons and daughters. Does it, at, at, at worst... The, the, the worst that happens, I, I remember when I was, well, it's another story for another time, and I said I was closing, but I remember my absolute, man, I, used, um, I was on a spiritual retreat, and I had this lady who was a spiritual director who just, I called her, I, I call her the Ignatian Ninja, because she just like this, this little sweet 70-year-old five-foot lady, and she just took me apart. It was unbelievable. Like, she was just like, like, it really was like a ninja, like hit the pressure points, and I'm just down, but like. I remember her telling me, you know, and I thought this was so beautiful, you know, like you're, that God looks at all of us. She said, like our greatest accomplishments, it's like a two-year-old. At that point, I had written my first book then, and she said, like your book. God looks at that book like, you know, when a kid, like a five-year-old brings their parents a, a drawing, and you're like, oh, that's amazing, and they put it up on the refrigerator. That's what your book is like to God. <laughs> it's like humbling and true. God's like... Oh, sweet, Jonathan wrote a book. Look at this book, everybody. Isn't this, is this awesome? It's like that. But she also said, and I'll never forget this, but she said also, like your biggest messes that you think are so awful, 
are also like when a, when a two-year-old messes their diapers. Like, it's, there's no surprise. There's no shock. Like, he doesn't like to see you suffering. He doesn't like to see you whatever, but there's no surprise in that. Boy, that, that, that relativizes things real fast, that the best thing I'm ever going to do is going to be a picture on the refrigerator. Oh, Daddy loves that. Thank you. And the, but the worst thing I'm ever going to do is mess my diapers. Like, it sounds really weird somehow coming out of my mouth right now. But y'all hear what I'm saying. I mean, isn't there something about that that's really beautiful? Like, that's just, that's just how God loves his kids. I just think somebody needs to hear that this morning. Stand with me if you would. I want to pray for you. And I'll pass it over.